Voice Division works with survivors of human atrocities to create works of art that memorialize their experience. This segment features two survivors, one child of a survivor, and one grandchild of a survivor. Each participant worked on her own piece, and they got together to work on a collaborative piece. One of the goals of Voice Division is to use a survivor's artwork to engage an audience in a dialogue about human atrocities, a subject far removed from most Americans' lives. The visual language used in the art speaks to people in a very different way than words do. Visual language can provoke people to reflect more deeply on a subject and to recall their own experiences of injustice, no matter how large or small. When this happens, an audience is better able to understand and relate to the survivor's experience. The historical event, once distant and removed, now becomes a part of their lives. Dahlia's mother lived in the Sudan during that country's bloody civil war. When she was seven months pregnant with Dahlia, some soldiers raided her village. As she fled, a group of militia stopped her, intending to shoot her. Her life was spared when one of the soldiers recognized her as a childhood friend. I picked this telephone because growing up, um, we didn't have a phone in our house, so if you ha had to make any phone calls, you had to use the phone booth that was down the street. You had to use like special little phone cards. And these phone calls were always so important like, because they would go on for like an hour or two, and all the family would like gather around, and you try to listen and hear from different members back home. And every phone call was always a little terrifying because somebody could be dead. I just remember a lot of people always, whenever the phone call came, there would always be like another person dead. And it used to um, really send me because when we got out of Sudan, it was only me and my, like me, my mom, and my siblings, and my dad, and I never got to meet any of my cousins, or my aunts, or my grandma, or anything, so I always wanted to have the experience of having an extended family, so whenever I got these phone calls, I would get so sad because it's like, oh, well, another person dead now, I never get the chance to see them. And actually, last summer, we got another phone call, and I had that same weird feeling that I used to have as a kid, and my grandmother had passed away, so. <laughs> Dragona was born in a small town in northern Bosnia and was 10 years old when war broke out in her country in the early 1990s. Near the end of the conflict, her family was forced to flee their home, along with thousands of others, when news spread that the Croatian army had launched a large-scale military attack on towns and villages in the region. I picked this little cart uh, it kind of reminded me of a um, time when I had to leave my town in uh, September 1995. My town is in northern Bosnia. I just couldn't believe that I had to leave. My father was in army in war, and lots of our men were in army, so it's mostly women and kids. And uh, when we heard the news that we have to uh, run away, that army will attack us, um, we kind of didn't know how to organize ourselves, didn't want to leave, and one of my neighbors um, decided to organize over 50 houses or families. For those of us who didn't have a car, she packed us in these little carts and hooked that, hooked that up to a tractor. So she had two of those behind her and a tractor. I was in the cart with her. So we were in this a big uh, traffic jam uh, for two, three days traveling to another city. I really didn't want to leave because I want to wait for my dad because I didn't know where he was. And um, he was like in another town uh, in a fighting zone. And um, a day or two days after, uh, enemy army came in and um, killed whoever stayed. So um, I always grant this woman, her name is Mara. I always say that she saved our lives. She saved the life of my whole uh, village. And she's really tough, boss-like lady. And uh, lots of people disagree with her. She runs business now in town, and lots of people disagree with her. But uh, I think people forget to uh, mention and thank her that she was the one who organized all of us, who saved our lives and um, 
I will, I will always be thankful to her. During World War II, Laura Zell's Jewish-Greek grandfather was rounded up in Athens and transported to Auschwitz, where he died in a crematorium. Laura's grandmother remained behind in Athens, where she managed to keep all of her children, including Laura's mother, in hiding in Athens during the Nazi occupation of Greece. This reminds me of a white tablecloth in Greece, the women would embroider linens, pillowcases, sheets, tablecloths, and it was for the daughter, their daughter's dowry when the, the, when the little girl got married. Um, and we have one of the only things that my family has is um, maybe a couple pillowcases and a tablecloth, a white tablecloth that my grandmother worked on. And I've always felt um, connected to that because it was her hands working this tablecloth and actually years later um, I was married under the tablecloth. We used it as a chuppah at my wedding and my cousin um, has also used it. A chuppah in Judaism when you get married you are married under a cloth, some sort of shelter with no walls. This is what my husband and I were married under was my grandma's tablecloth. M my grandma, she is the surviving parent of um, my mom's family, and she brought five kids to America after um, her husband and her sister and two of her brothers and a nephew and niece and other extended families were taken to Auschwitz from Athens and um, died in the crematorium, and she was um, went back into hiding with the little kids, and so she was the survivor to bring everybody to America. Joanna Sussman's Jewish parents were imprisoned in a Nazi concentration camp during World War II. Joanna's father was liberated by the Americans and later immigrated to the United States. During the 1960s, he served as a witness at the Nuremberg trials. The first is this little pair of glasses, which are from the Mr. Potato Head, but stand in for the eyeglasses of real people. When the Jews were taken to the concentration camps and from there um, to the gas chambers and crematoria. They were stripped of everything that they owned, all of their clothes, everything, including, of course, their eyeglasses. And my uncle was one of the people who lost his eyeglasses at that time, and he was very nearsighted, and he lived through the next several years unable to see the world clearly. And that could be both a good thing and a bad thing. You know, he could literally not see the world clearly, but of course, metaphorically, living in this crazy world of the Holocaust, he couldn't see what was going on in the real world either, and it was like living in an alternate universe, which is kind of what he always said. So I picked this thing here first that looks kind of like a machine gun mounted on something. I used to have these nightmares growing up about how I was with my mother when she was almost shot um, back when she was still in Sudan. And years later, I realized that when this incident took place, I was, she was still pregnant with me, so I was still in the womb. But I had all these like, dreams that felt like I was actually there. Growing up, I developed this, like, just this fear of um, different scenes in movies. Like I'd be watching a movie, and they would have a scene where like, a bunch of men are like, pulling out a gun or something, and I would just get like really physically uncomfortable and like frightened for no reason. So this is why I picked this. And I was, I was interesting because like years later when I asked her again to like retell me the story and she was like, oh, you weren't born yet. And I'm like, well, but then I remember the details. <laughs> so, so I don't know if she ever told me the story like when I was younger and then she just forgot about it or what, but that memory is just in my mind. This I picked up because it's a superhero. I picked the superhero because to me, my parents were superheroes. I have never been able to really figure out how they could go from the darkness of the Holocaust into a whole new life here in the United States, start a new family after everything that they had lost, and continue to be human beings, having come from a world where so many people didn't behave as human beings. Well, these blue beads reminded me of my uncle's worry beads, and my uncle was my mom's brother. 
and he was really the unsung hero of her um, surviving the war. Um, he was 15 at the time and saw, saw the roundup that happened in Greece um, where my grandfather was taken and um, he was the one that kind of guided um, the kids. There were four girls and took a push cart and went back into um, the hiding spot. The worry beads in Greece, men use them. They kind of wrap them in between their fingers and it's kind of like a nervous energy thing. I don't know. If, and they actually sit there and they twirl them through. I can't do it. Um, first of all, this isn't tied. But when my grand, when my uncle passed away, I um, he left me his worry beads in their cobalt blue. So this very much reminded me of those. So I always kind of thought of all these monuments from World War II or World War I or what our uh, people uh, or grandparents, parents went through through all these wars because World War I started in, uh, uh, as you know, in Bosnia. This is the monument from World War II um, of a woman who was hanged by Germans and there were several of those when they would catch the, because there was lots of resistance in Bosnia. The time when I realized that war is actually happening in my country is when my uh, neighbor died in war. I just saw him uh, that week before he left for um, fighting. And uh, I gave him some pears, and we just talked, and uh, he left, and then he never came back. And that was uh, kind of realization for me that war, it's, it's real. The soccer ball represents the happy time where, you know, you could go anywhere. You, you were so free in ex-Yugoslavia, you could have slept in a park and nobody would <laughs> do anything to you. So it was such a, you know, uh, almost crime-free country. Um, and it's not like that now. <laughs> and then there is a picture of my grandma over here. She's my favorite lady. She kind of um, kept the family going through all this, through war, and she was the big pro provider when my dad went to army. <laughs> I remember that I drew that sort of white triangular building back there that has sort of three lines in it. And that was because I had seen Laura draw the Parthenon up in the corner. And her story is a Greek story, as we all know. And I drew what I thought was more like the Supreme Court, which mirrored the, the image of the Parthenon and stood for justice and righteousness. And I thought it was just a really interesting image about how the world ought to be. The Hebrew word chayim is the word for life. And then I remember that that little square with the German on it that says den Toten zur Er, den Lebenden zur Manung is for the sort of loosely translated means to memorialize the dead and remember the living, some, something like that. And that is from a memorial at Dachau concentration camp where my dad was imprisoned during the war. And when we, we went back as a family to visit Dachau when I was a teenager, and I saw that memorial plaque, so that's something that really resonated for me. But the one other image that I think is really important is the tree, and we have two tree images in there. We have the stump at the bottom, which, as I said, in purple is really dramatic, and the symbol of the Jewish community after the war, of the survivor community, is a, a tree stump with all its branches cut off, and there were many pieces of art and ceramics and things of this tree stump because the Jewish people had been cut off. There's a symbol in Jewish life of we have a tree of life and that's really what that sort of abstract tree in the middle was, you know, very much to represent the reflowering of the Jewish community after the Holocaust. <laughs> I put this door here because growing up I had a lot of um, 
I did a lot of eavesdropping to learn about my background. Like we used to have a lot of um, different political um, or social or military kind of gatherings at my house growing up and you know, all the men would gather into one room and close the door and they'll be like smoking and hush hush tones and whatnot into the night talking about different things and I would like either peek into the doors open and at some point I actually my bedroom was right next to the living room where they had these meetings and there was a little hole in the wall so I would just like try to see <laughs> through the hole listening to see what's going on and I painted the background really red because like they would talk about some horrific things and about different people dying it's always like just so much bloodshed these here are funeral posts and um, I put them there because it just represents all the people that have died, including my own family members in this conflict over the years. And I put the church there because that church is a very central church. The city is largely Catholic. Like my entire family is very Catholic and very into their Catholic faith. <laughs> so it was very important for me to put that church there because most of the photos that we had from coming from home had my family members standing in front of this church. So it's a very intricate part. And these here are crosses like the ones you would find in a graveyard. And at the same time, different photographs that I have at home of different family members, like my grandfather on my father's side or some uncles or whatnot, have like crosses on their forehead. We have this tradition where like when somebody dies, you go back into your family photos and you just mark all of them with the cross. So then it just signals that they have passed on. I have an immense fear of bees because I don't know how old I was. And at this point, I'm not sure if I was there, but it's a very intense memory where um, we were traveling from one town to the next for whatever reason. It wasn't a, during conflict time, because we were just passing through somewhere. We passed by a bee farm, and something happened in the bee farm, and all the bees woke up and they came out swarming and they attacked. And my mother covered me and my sister and my aunt underneath this really thick blanket until they could like settle down and swarm and go away or whatever. But some people actually died from the bee stings because they just like got bit so horribly. Uh, um, there's a story where like one night when my mother was still pregnant with me, a couple, it was, it was like pretty late, late term, I'm thinking like seven, eight months or something. I think it was the militia group, but we were not clear if it was the like, militia group or it was actually like the Sudanese government, which is the North which we were fighting against. They came in and attacked and we were, what, we, what people would do is they would flee into the, what we call the bush, which is just like you flee into the forest and whatnot. And midway through the fleeing, um, my mother got stopped by a truck of soldiers. And if you ever seen like on the news, like they drive in this big pickup truck things and they like mount their machinery on there and they all carry like their AK-47s or whatever. And like they stopped this woman in the middle of the road and she's pregnant and they were like about to shoot. And she kept like begging for her life like not to shoot and one of the soldiers or militia men recognized her voice and apparently they had gone to school together or were friends at some point and he convinced them not to shoot and they let her go. And I almost felt like I was there because I had nightmares growing up and like these dreams and I would have um, really frightening physical reactions when I have like scenes that mimic that. So I don't like, I try not to watch the news too much, which is interesting because I watch, I could watch like Rambo, but mm -hmm. I won't watch things that like would trigger that kind of memory. And then years later when I finally asked her, she was like, um, you were not even out of the womb yet, so. You were, you were kind of there. Yeah, I, I suppose. <laughs> Voice to vision rests on the premise that visual language captures an element of the human experience that words alone cannot. Perhaps it is true that history is more fully communicated through art rather than through the written word.